How do instructors know when they are facilitating or hindering the classroom experience? Hello and welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 25. Today is October 13th, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart calling from beautiful Aguascalientes. Morning, everybody. This is Piri Herrera, also here in Aguascalientes, hoping you're having a nice morning here in our town. We are in the middle of the change of season. So uh, for moments, it's really hot and for moments, it's really fresh. But we are having fun with this weather and our clothes. Ben, good morning. Good morning, Pity. Uh, yes, things are moving right along here. We, we've finished uh, week nine of this semester. Things are going very quickly. Um, trying to keep up with all the classwork and students and uh, just trying to get through the semester. It's been a really good semester for me so far. I know we've talked a lot about our classroom experiences, and actually this episode is no exception. I think today is going to be a really good opportunity for us to kind of dig deep into what we talked about last week with test-based learning. We had a really good discussion last week, episode 24, where we talked about different aspects of test-based learning, different models. But today we get kind of in the, the details, the devil's in the details, as they say, Petey. So today I think we're going to have a good opportunity to really dive deep into some concrete examples and maybe some things that uh, teachers can reflect upon when they're looking at their own teaching practice in terms of test-based learning. But before we get into uh, today's discussion, I want to, we want to encourage everyone to be a part of uh, the community here by checking us out in Facebook. We have a Facebook page that's public. It's open to anyone, Teacher Learning Cast. You'll find uh, links to all prior episodes that we have. We're trying to build a repository of all the recordings that we've had in the past. So check us out in uh, Facebook. Right, follow us in our websites too. You can uh, Google, that's the easiest way to get to us. Just Google uh, Teacher Learning Cast Benjamin Stewart or Teacher Learning Cast PD Herrera. And you can find all the social networks we have, our personal website. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things you can find there in, in our pages. Uh, you can go back to prior shows that we have had. And, um, and you can uh, leave comments in any of those questions or suggestions or whatever you want to share with us just that we can uh, take it into account for further programs here in Teacher Learning Cast. A lot of the things we talk about in the show relate to our own uh, teaching and learning context. We teach at, at a BA program in English language teaching. So a lot of the discussions that we have are focused around our experiences that we have with our students. But a lot of the topics that we talk about really ex extend to general education. So uh, we think that uh, this podcast has appeal for not just English language teachers, but general English as well. So share your experiences, especially today. We've got a really good discussion uh, about the role of the teacher and when to know if what we're doing actually is promoting or, or facilitating the educative experience or perhaps even interfering with the, the educative experience, depending on you know, what, uh, what the students are doing and how aware teachers are. So I don't know, Pete, if you want to dive into it, maybe provide an example so we can begin our, our dis this discussion about, about the teacher's role in the classroom. Right. Last time we were uh, talking about some aspects related to uh, specifically your class in writing, right? And, and you were giving us some examples of what, what you were doing during the week with the students. Uh, and, and taking students step by step. And that made me, that remind me some of the things I do with my students uh, when I get into a specific topics, specific, specifically mentioning things related to the theory or uh, aspects in which they need examples uh, to start creating their own ideas in order to teach. My students are pre-service teachers who are uh, for the first time teaching. They, they've been teaching for uh, one semester already, but amongst themselves in simulated classes. So uh, that reminded me when I get into these uh, details or a theoretical aspects or examples, uh, there's always a decision to make. How do I do it? Do I uh, get through 
through the idea as a whole and then start breaking it down if needed or do I start it chunk by chunk, piece by piece, taking students uh, uh, like hand by hand, step by step, showing them a piece of the puzzle at a time and then at the end creating a whole concept or a whole idea. And, and, uh, and that's what, what, uh, what raised the question because today it's mostly putting out the question on the table, right? <laughs> and see what comes up. Uh, and, and, and I think the question you mentioned at the beginning of the transmission, it's, it's kind of enclosing a uh, couple of questions I had, uh, I had uh, in relation to this, which is uh, how do you know whether whatever you are doing, I'm, I'm talking about the example of breaking it down or putting it as a whole. Uh, when you talk about the input, right? But uh, how do you know whether the decision you made is facilitating or vice versa, hindering the classroom experience for students? And uh, that's the big question because um, it, it's not always the same thing, right? For some students, it's going to be one thing. For some others, it's going to be a different thing. But uh, how do you, the teacher, know if you are actually helping or blocking students' development. Yeah, I mean, we used the example last week in my class, in my writing class, where I'm trying to focus, in fact, this entire se semester, I'm trying to focus a little bit more in task-based learning. I just kind of find myself actually focusing uh, more on this because I, I think that, you know, in my case, my students are really working towards a particular goal for the week. And, and in my case, it's uh, it's, uh, helping them develop a body paragraph because th that's that's the goal for for this particular class. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question really is, you know, how do you break that down? You know, we've talked about other examples like for listening, mm -hmm. uh, you know, listening example. But how do you break that down? Do you present it within some sort of quote unquote authentic type of task and and the, um, for example, the acquisition of vocabulary kind of emerges, or yeah. do we preload or pre or we do we present or pre-teach certain vocabulary at the beginning of the task in order to better prepare them or enable them into a more uh, interactive uh, activity that's that's really I think the the question here and I think that when we look at something like this we have to take into context uh, obviously the type of activity, or the performance task, which we've talked a lot about in prior episodes, mm -hmm. what's the performance task and how do we get there? And what kind of activities do we do on a day-to-day -day basis that help learners uh, pre better prepare for that particular task? And so when we look at task-based learning, I think that some of the, the, the instructional learning episodes that we talked about last week, this idea of reproductive versus productive, uh, knowledge versus skill, metacognitive versus cognitive, and these far versus near transfer. I think all of those are part of the the quote unquote answer to this this question of how do we present our particular you know those particular uh, activities. And you know I'm thinking in terms of your case, I don't know if you can share an example of maybe uh, with a, a student where he or she, maybe upon reflection realized that they made a wrong choice in how they organized either one particular activity or certain techniques within a particular activity. Um, can you share a particular uh, case? Yeah, uh, following up what you were mentioning about listening, uh, the prior weeks we've been working with teaching listening uh, in, in this class for pre-service pre teachers in simulated classes, 15 minutes classes. And uh, they, as the idea in here is that uh, listening at the end is one of the skills which is kind of um, not complex, but different to organize in, in order to actually teach versus test what the students actually know. Uh, they, I, I'm, what I mean by this is that, for example, it's not like a grammar structure which you can show in an example or with the technical terms break it down or put the whole sentence as a whole and then go through the pieces and explain to students what a verb is, what a, what a noun is, and all of these aspects are piece by piece. Or, and then 
bring them together and uh, actually give them a, a clue or hint or a format to follow for further uh, for further uh, use of the same structure. Um, maybe it's not like pronunciation in which you actually can help the students with the articulation of the specific sound uh, using the different phonemes and the different uh, uh, muscles in your mouth and the pieces that have to be moved in a certain way and you can actually explain that and take students through that explanation. In the case of listening, uh, at the moment of listening, you cannot tell a student, like, you have to open your, your ear like this in order to understand this sound. That's no way. Whatever you do, it's going to be prior or after the actual listening. Whether you use a strategy uh, in which you, you pause the audio and you actually help them a lot, the actual moment of listening is the students by their own. So yeah, it, it, it all comes to the idea of, are you actually helping them to develop the skills with everything you do in the pre-listening prior, or are you, um, are you just asking them to do a listening test and then verifying if they did it or not? That's where the question uh, started, this, this idea of, am I interfering or not? So uh, we started to see some ideas in order to help students uh, actually develop this skill, like many things to be done during the pre-listening in order to prepare students to give them information about the context, about what they're going to hear, maybe the kind of words, the sounds, or sometimes even the script of whatever they're going to hear in order to help them during the actual listening. And then uh, after listening, uh, verifying whatever they, whatever the task is, I mean, if, if they had to answer true or false or fill in the blanks or whatever it is. But after after listening and verifying the idea of uh, the need of listening again in order for the students that didn't get it in the moment of listening to actually have the opportunity now that they know the answers and that they know they have more help and more support actually to re-listen again and then listen again. We also saw some things about the use of strategies like pausing in, right, in strategic moments during the listening in order to help a little bit more students to understand whatever we need, uh, we, we want to be the key to be understood. So that's pretty much the, 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 the scenario about teaching listening. Now at the end, the final decision, uh, or, or maybe, I don't know if it's the final or it's the first, uh, for the first decision is, what do I do? Do I start by playing the whole thing and asking them to do it? and then see what they got? Or shall I prepare them step by step with the vocabulary, with, uh, with uh, the type of sounds, with information, with images, with whatever that can help them to, to have an, an, easier, um, um, an, easier, an easier way to go through the listening when the actual listening happens. And whatever happens in between, right? I mean, different degrees of support prior to the listening. So it, it goes back to the same idea, to the same question. Do I go for the whole thing, the whole bunch of information and ask the students to deal with it? Or do I break it down step by step and then at the end we make it a whole? And that's what, uh, what, what gave me the question. Now, whatever you decide, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer of what to do, what to do first or what to do next. But the question is, how do you identify whether your decision actually supported the students or not? And the specific case, after all this said, is, for example, one of the students played an audio uh, and he decided to play for the first time as a pre-listening to familiarize the students with the sound. And the idea was after it, he would bring a, a worksheet to complete. They would explore the worksheet and then they would go to the actual listening to do it again, to, to actually do it for the first time. I mean, to complete the worship, to identify specific information uh, that was needed to, to be completed on the worship. But what happened there is that when the teacher played the video for the, for the it was a video with audio for the first time, uh, they finished listening, the teacher gave the worship and the students had already the answers for it. So, uh, and then what the teacher decided to do is to keep on his activity 
as if they didn't have the answers as the teacher had it planned since the beginning. And that's when, again, the question came, is that interference or is, is the teacher blocking the progress? Is there another decision that should have been made at that moment because the students were, went way ahead uh, in, in what the teacher had planned? And how is the teacher detecting or sensing that? And what is the kind of decision that you have to make? And that also remind me your example from last week in, in, in writing, in which some students wanted to go ahead in certain things. And, uh, and, and we didn't get deep into that, but pretty much you, uh, my question in there would be, uh, what, whatever they had, was it, what, was it the outcome that, was, that, that uh, was expected for the end of the week at the moment they show it? Was it the right moment to go through it? Uh, was it, uh, I mean, did they have to go through a prior process or how do you actually know that maybe they went through the process in a faster fashion in that same session? I don't know. I mean, so all of this created at the end, the question of the million. Am I actually helping it by putting the whole task as a whole for them? Or am I blocking uh, the learning because, because they cannot do it or the other way around? Am I blocking learning because I'm breaking it down when they can actually go for a bigger bite or not? That yeah, I think there's a, a distinction we need to make here, though. First, is in your example where you said that the students already knew the answers in your uh, teaching practicum <laughs> class, I think it's important to mention that these, quote unquote, students are actually the, the teacher trainers yeah. that are taking yeah. the course, That's right? So. So they're going to, you know, they're going to have a higher level of English than uh, than the actual lesson, the intention of the lesson, right? The lesson, I'm assuming, is going to be at a lower level that than the students actually have. Putting that aside, though, I think we can imagine cases where maybe the similar the similar type of uh, situation might occur where students already know the answers in a real life class. Uh, and, and let me let me let me complete that with uh, cases that I've seen before in other kind of courses when I go to observe. The uh, teachers design worksheets which can actually be answered by logical thoughts and then the listening is not needed. So it's pretty much the same idea. They already got the answers, right? <laughs> And I think this goes back to the key aspect that we talked about last week when we looked at instructional learning episodes is that I know that in your case, you're looking at a specific uh, class in isolation, perhaps. But in real life, usually, you know, classes are moving and student teachers are becoming familiar on a day to day basis as to the level of the students. And in many cases, whether they're using task-based learning or not, that there should be some sort of continuity or, or series of uh, skills and knowledge that build upon prior classes, right? So, so I think that, you know, one of the things that I would question if this comes up where a teacher prepares something and students can already really complete the, the answers, I think the question might be is, well, what have they been doing prior and what kind of information are they getting to make a decision to, to use that particular handout or to do that particular activity where the students already know the answer? So I think part of the issue here, part of the question is, how can we become better informed as we're learning from our students on a day-to-day -day basis as to their level of skill and knowledge so that all subsequent classes are designed such that they're building on what they know, right? So, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, in my class, I might perhaps err on the other side where maybe I'm expecting too much and I have to backtrack, you know, I, I would much rather shoot high and then bring it back a little bit easier just to avoid what you're mentioning, just to avoid this problem of setting up a situation where, well, they already know the answers, right? And and, right. and it was just kind of a waste of time. Right. This this uh, that you mentioned brings me back at something that we've discussed priorly in, in, in other programs about a wider view of the of the class itself. And I think this is a recurrent topic we are going back to the idea of not just focusing on the day's activity 
not just focusing on what's going to happen to them in my classroom and uh, which sometimes is what uh, teachers tend to do because of planning time, because of the number of classes they have, the number of groups and the different tasks that they have to uh, fulfill in their different schools. And uh, some of them, they just uh, have a general plan for the week and then day by day, they actually go through, through, the, through the specifics and, on, and the actual objective. And um, I've seen other cases in which they actually have an objective for the week or for the block, as they call it like for different classes and that helps a little bit more when you have a wider view to have this uh, i mean to have this idea but i go beyond that knowing uh, not just uh, the objective or the block but knowing more about your students knowing more uh, have been more uh, like raising your awareness about where the syllabus for uh, for this the uh, course uh, i mean the uh, at the level of the planning, the level of the program, and the level of the the syllabus itself, where this program fits, what that, what this, um, and uh, having this wider view with this knowledge, objectives, uh, contents, knowing students, and being able to make this decision, thinking about further classes, not only the moment itself. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm just trying to put myself into the, the shoes of taking a class where I have to. The only, you know, the thing that I'm doing is developing a 15 minute right activity <laughs> with yeah. my classmates, right? Yeah. And that's that's a challenge in and of itself. I mean, it's a different type of challenge than I. I think, in my op opinion, it's a different type of challenge than teaching maybe for the first time or second time uh, to a real class. So mm -hmm. I think that that's that's a uh, you know an interesting perspective that when students are in that type of situation they need to learn how to transfer that experience that learning experience to uh, the real the real classroom but I think it goes back to what we've talked about before a lot of, uh, in terms of just trying to build on one class to the next and and really knowing your your students and finding out what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, maybe in this case, in the lesson planning stage where the, the student is, or the teacher, the teacher trainer is looking at the, um, is looking at the handouts, maybe just asking themselves, okay, can someone fill this out without even having listened to the video, for example, or having, and not having listened to the audio and just having that dialogue or that, that reflective, you know, uh, conversation with the tutor or with with their classmates before the actual class, right? So you mentioned, you know, these activities that we do before the listening, during the listening, and after listening. But as a teacher, right, we can reflect before we have class. We reflect wow. during the class, and we can reflect afterwards. So I think um, looking at how we reflect beforehand, not only in the activity itself, but what has what has been transpired in the past and that's where it gets difficult in your case in this particular yeah. class where again they're working almost by design in isolation they're in isolated tasks yeah. if you look if you look at in-service teachers that work even in blocks right that there might be an overall goal for that particular block but it's still a matter of how do i break down you know each week each two to three days, four days, depending on when the classes meet and trying to build on a, you know, a class to class basis or a lesson to lesson basis so that you have this continuity between the learning experience and you don't have these blocks of isolated cases. I think teaching in isolation, these isolated classes is really, uh, you know, something that we, we need to consider Right. As being a, a challenge for us is trying to avoid that because even like in course books, you know, <clears throat> course books. I, I'm not. I have nothing against course books. I think they have a place and and they're they're helpful for uh, busy teachers, right? But we need to look at how we can build on. And some course books do it better than others, but uh, really how to build on building the skills, the language skills of the of the learner and really making decisions about at what point do I teach individual language skills? At what point do I try to integrate those? Uh, 
Mm -hmm. and what combination works best for the particular goals that I'm setting. Yeah, that's also part of the breaking down. Are you going to break down actually the skills? What happened uh, precisely on Tuesday? On Tuesday, we had a class in which I liked the class. In fact, I'm, I asked permission to the teacher for using this class as uh, as an example, as, as a reasonable example of uh, of a content class for a general teaching class. She talked about. He talked about. Um, uh, he was uh, kind of forgot about the context, but the, the idea was focused mainly on the context itself. It was, I guess it was one about tips for a job interview. And the whole class was, ba was based on that. And it was a nice class. It was a very well integrated class. He focused on the context. He managed a linguistic topic with was a, a conditional but he never actually mentioned it openly because the whole focus was the tips for the job interview. But he actually knew he was focused, uh, all of these tips were ex exposed in the audio as a conditional. The situation in this class was that the actual listening practice was a third of the class, just one activity. He planned three small activities in which just one of them was the listening practice. So we are actually going through the idea of listening and covering the listening practice. And, and uh, it was very difficult to handle the feedback for this class because on one side, I had to make clear that he lost track of the objective of having a listening practice for the 15 minutes. But on the other side, he had a very nice class in which he actually could integrate uh, different skills. He managed to focus on a context, which I'm fond of that as uh, that idea, focusing language classes on the context more than anything else uh, of context and function. And, and then uh, obviously the function with the linguistic aspect. And, the, and, and then he managed to use technology. He used Kahoot in his second activity. And then in the third activity, he made an interactive activity at the board. So it was a very nice class. But the focus that we were looking at for developing the skill of focusing on listening was, a, was just a third of the class. In fact, I, I came up with a diagram on the board, like showing him, like, these are your three activities. What did you do on this one? And we, we, we made a, a, an a quick, uh, like, a raw analysis of uh, the aspects he covered. And then when he actually saw the diagram, the three aspects, from what, what he was answering in the questions I was asking, he actually saw the listening practice was just in a third of the class. So it was kind of difficult to handle that feedback in a sense that the backwash effect for this teacher is, was not negative because he did a fine job. He, he was doing very interesting things and, and I had to pinpoint them. At the same time, I had to pinpoint that he lost track of the listening objective at, a mo at any moment in planning, at some moment in his planning, right? But, uh, but again, it went back to the same question. He broke, uh, do we break it down and, and we focus only on one skill or not? Uh, or, or can we leave this integration? I, in that moment, I remember something we discussed about Jeremy Harmer when he talks about this idea, which I call romantic, in which you have the students uh, spontaneously talking about certain topics and taking the opportunity to uh, to teach about that. So I saw this as an opportunity to actually stress the idea that he managed to have a very well contextualized and balanced class for 15 minutes. So that was going to be my question. This This particular case, this student was in the class that teaches 15 minutes with their classmates, right? Right. Yes. Same. Okay. So that's interesting. So, you know, we've talked about in prior episodes, we talked about the SIAP model, content yeah. and language integrated learning or CLIL also, um, mm -hmm. where, you know, there's actually techniques that are involved in helping content subject matter teachers learn how to also incorporate English mm -hmm. into their own content courses. And I think we can take a lot of these same principles and adapt those to the general English uh, scenario, I, I, we've talked about this a lot that, you know, 
one way to look at even general English is to teach, treat it like a content course or teach mm -hmm. or treat it like a English for specific purposes, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, a class where, where language is used as a means to discuss and, and really achieve certain content goals. And so I think having this dual objective of language goals and content goals, I think will go a long way to general English teachers as well, even though the content, usually the content objectives are really not the focus. Sometimes I think we focus actually too much on the language and with no context, the, the content provides the context, right? So right. if you're looking at certain content for, like you said, going to the doctor's office, but, but make it you know, that's where these essential questions come come up, where there's a driving question, a deep thinking question that really comes back to the root of both the content and the language. So the content helps develop the language. The language helps develop the content. And it's this back and forth. And this goes back to, OK, what do I focus on? Do I focus more on the content? Do I focus more on the language? And I think that it's it can be difficult in a class such as uh, the one you're you're uh, yeah. discussing where you're looking actually in 15 minute blocks. But I think in the in, in the, the reflection part of that is to be able to conceptualize as the teacher trainer, conceptualize the situation of those 15 minutes and be able to articulate, okay, this is one activity, but it's a part of this bigger, right. uh, bigger objective. And that they can, they can recognize that objective. Maybe, you know, maybe it's not, as clear as you know as it would be a, a, for for someone who has a lot of experience but you can the idea is that they can you know even though maybe the class itself is more focused on a particular individual skill that they can articulate the the goal and then vice versa like in your mm -hmm. case this case of the the teacher that you mentioned maybe he d does a really good job of the content mm -hmm. part um but you know but that maybe needs to allow a little bit more time for for the language. So I think it's a uh, you know there's really no clear answer here, but I think it's maintaining this balance and this understanding of content objectives versus language objectives, mm -hmm. and then how to integrate those two together in a meaningful way for the students. Right, there are a couple of things you mentioned which which actually are, are going on in that in that class. For example. Um, uh, this this idea of, of uh, uh, like shortening the class and planning for 15 minutes, yes, is something that by itself it's it's given a turn with them because many of them are actually uh, planning beyond the 15 minutes. When they come to tutoring, uh, when they come prior to their class, they have a lot of ideas, they have a lot of things to do, they are thinking about beyond the 15 minutes. And uh, they just come to 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 verify if they are if they are doing okay by selecting certain piece of that plan. And we haven't even really discussed this that openly, like telling them you are doing beyond this. I mean, you are actually planning beyond fifteen minutes. You are planning more than an hour class. You are thinking about a further class, a follow up for these activities. I mean, and obviously this is an activity which um, what happens here is that sometimes classes go very dynamically because they they are already they are teachers information so they have certain level of the language and certain topics allow the students to go faster so we just explore the possibility and the idea that whatever they plan for the 15 minutes is something that it's applicable for a one hour class in a class when it's going to get at a slower pace they're going to require, for example, in the case of listening, they're going to require more times of listening. They're going to require more support for the teacher when checking and activities are going to extend a little bit more. But beyond that, they are actually planning things. They are planning activities to complement their idea because they sense by themselves that 15 minutes is not enough to achieve, the, for example, the pre, the while, and the post listening uh, as they expect to do it implementing technology and having dynamic activities and showing their skills that the skills that they have developed before for interacting with the students and and class control and technical aspects and, and themselves they bring those ideas and they just tell me if it's okay if 
uh, if they cut it off. I mean, and some of them, they have already the answer. They just want to verify. And some of them are afraid of that. I'm going to tell them, no, you have to go through all of this or something like that. But it's been like, uh, I kind of remember right now, three of them in which I told them, well, just put it in the lesson plan. I know where you are heading. I know which is going to be the end. And I know you're not going to make the end of this. I know you're not going to get there because you don't have time. But whatever you structure before is going to give us the, the view of what it's going to be the end. And at the end, they decide what to cut. That on one side. Um, on the other side, there are students that come prior to their class and they have with a lot of doubts and a lot of questions about what they plan. We start reflecting precisely on this and at the end there's no change. There is no adding to the plan. There is nothing else that they, that they want to modify. They feel comfortable with, what that, with whatever they have. But what happens here is that during the reflection period, they get more awareness of what they actually plan. They get more, uh, they get like a, like a second point of view of what they thought before and that gives them confidence and they come with very good plans. I had a class with another girl this week also, which everything she planned worked very well. She, it actually looked like she was, uh, she was following the lesson plan like step by step, which never happens. So that's something I mentioned. She was, because everything worked exactly the way she expected. And, and the thing is that uh, she was kind of, I sense, I'm not sure about this, but I sense like she was kind of thinking that it was because we had a long session in, in reflect, I mean, in, with me before the class about her planning. Uh, but uh, I, we never came to change anything for her plan. Everything she planned, everything she thought, every, everything she expected to happen was before she even came to reflecting, with, with, I mean, to the session with me to verify her lesson plan. Uh, all I did was just to launch a couple of questions just to reaffirm if she had the answers of those questions that she actually did. And at the end, everything, uh, I, I, like, I like that class uh, in, in, from the point of view that she, was, uh, she had a good time of reflection to understand how the class would go, meaning that she knew her students very well and she knew exactly what her activities and the things she was asking would lead the students towards. So uh, I think that, that kind of... Um, goes a little bit into the answer of uh, how do I know, well, if, if there's an answer, right? How do I know if I'm actually helping or interfering? I think uh, the most we can do is to reflect and be prepared the most we can. With this wider view, knowing the students, knowing the, the objectives we have, knowing the plan, having alternatives if, if needed, uh, having a uh, plans for anticipated problems or assumptions that we are making about the classroom the best we can. And then when we actually come to execute in the classroom, be also prepared to reflect at that moment and, and uh, take another direction if needed. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking, Petey, let, let's take Let's go back to this example because, yeah, you've got cases where students are planning and classes are going well, just as expected, and then you've got the opposite where maybe they, they don't happen as expected. But I'm, I'm curious about going back to these instructional learning episodes that we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if we can take both situations. Let's take, let's take the student where the class goes very well, everything goes wonderful, wonderfully. Mm -hmm. But if we have, if we ask the student in terms of these uh, instructional episodes versus, for example, reproductive versus productive, mm -hmm. were the students in that particular class, were they being productive or reproductive? Were they being productive where they were actually generating uh, knowledge, creating no uh, knowledge or language versus just kind of, re uh, kind of remote, uh, you know, language or through memorization? Uh, through rote uh, repetition, right? Having that type of dialogue, because you might say mm -hmm. to the learner, 
to the teacher trainer, okay, yeah, the class went as expected, but were they were their learners being productive or reproductive, right? That that's one case. Right. And you could take each one of these and have that same similar that similar conversation. Were they promoting knowledge or skill or both? This kind of goes back to our discussion on content objectives versus language objectives, right? Because maybe again, the idea of that good lesson that went well was focused more on skill when it could have, or at least, you know, what would it have looked like if they also focused on knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Or content. You could also go down, down the line here, metacognitive versus cognitive. Maybe the class went well cognitively. Was there any, were there any opportunities to expand it metacognitively and far and near context, right? So the learners, and, and this is all again, focusing on the learners, quote unquote learners, right? In your, in this case, were, was the, the situation very unique? Was it different where the learners themselves actually had to generate knowledge and or language in this new context? Or was this a very similar context that went well or went poorly, right? I think it really takes reflection to another level because it looks at all of these eight aspects and, and forget about moving from one task to the next. Just look uh -huh. at it from one isolated Right. Uh, activity and us as teachers being able to reflect on each of those eight situations in terms of okay things quote unquote went well or went poorly but in terms of each of those eight uh character types of episodes yeah she managed i mean it was the we are we were still working on the listening aspect and she managed to cover two different aspects in that sense about knowledge and skills they were kind of uh, practicing the listening skill, and they were at, even even though they are they are pre-service teachers, this felt like an actual real class because they were practicing the listening skill, and uh, what they were actually doing were discriminating. I mean, identifying a specific pieces of language in the listening, and then in those in those uh, sentences or utterances, they had to identify minimal changes that the teacher made between the, um, the worksheet and the actual listening. And that was pretty much the listening focus. I mean, he, she covered two aspects in that sense. Identifying a specific language within uh, a, a, a bigger listening, and but then within those pieces of languages, it, identifying the minimal change she was having. Small things like, um, I don't know, for example, it, it had something uh, kind of don't remember exactly what what the worship said, but uh, kind of a minimal per things with words, but in sentences, right? The, the sentence has one change, and they have to do this. So on that side, that was the and, and that was something she she mentioned when we when I asked her. So what is the listening aspect they are practicing? And we we managed to 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 see that she is covering two aspects at the same time. The listening was about uh, flags in the world. And uh, the idea of why the color purple is not in any flag in the world. And it became new knowledge for students. So uh, it managed pretty much both things at the same time. Though the class was intended mostly to, fo to be focused on the listening practice. She covered a lot of listening practice in the different activities she managed during the 15 minutes. And at the same time, she covered new knowledge for students based on the context she decided to use. And okay, so let's let's take another uh, perspective, though. Let's take that same student, same situation. What about in terms of productive versus reproductive, uh, you know, a knowledge or skills? And I'm thinking now in terms of her students, not not her as a teacher, but yeah. the the quote unquote students that that participated. Would would you think that? they were being more productive or reproductive even though i know that this was a listening exercise exactly. That's you know right. we still need to look at because the only way that we can judge whether or not they learned right is mm -hmm. through some sort of production whether it's writing or speaking so right. my question is this productive versus reproductive what do you think uh, was the main focus kind of kind of case? difficult to uh, now that you mention it because the home class is based on listening pretty much so there is nothing to actually reproduce since it's a comparison between what they listen and what they read in that sense. 
And that's the problem. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that in general. And I, in like when we focus on isolated skills and we're focusing on listening and listening is right. a good example. All right. The tendency is hand out a little true and false or multiple choice. All and right. that's it. We move on where there's a lot of other things to consider when, you know, uh, you know, incorporating listening, uh, comprehension skills in, in the English language classroom thinking in terms of, okay, what kind of, uh, writing or speaking activity can I link to that listening exercise? Well, let's just remind that in this class that the pr pretty much the idea is that they focus on a specific small task and skills because this is the first time and we want them to uh, develop certain aspects related specifically. Like for example, in the first course, we base on technical aspects like the movements, like the eye contact, like the position in the classroom, like uh, uh, qu uh, launching question for students, very specific things. This is the second course in which we go through the skills, but with the idea of focusing and students are actually focusing the activity itself. That's why it's a 15 minutes term, focusing the activity itself only in the skill. Obviously, this would be as a part of a, of a whole in a class, which that's why I brought up the example from the other students in which he's having a balanced class. And at the end, that's he is way ahead in that sense, somehow, of what we want, right? In that sense. Right. So, so in this case, and, and I'm because I'm not familiar with, with this situation. Right. Right. And I think I think it's important to kind of work out some of these details. In in a typical fifteen minute class, how much, how does the teacher talk time relate to the student talk time? In general. Oh, uh, what do you mean the amount of talking from one and the other? Yeah, I mean, if you were just to look at any given fifteen minute class right. in this particular case, how much do, does the teacher talk? versus the students my objective every time with these students is to make them to have a balance at least and this is something we work since course one and we still work it in this course because some students struggle with that and any kind and, and that's a, that's a basic skill i focus on in any talk i mean in any if we focus on listening or writing or reading or the eye contact thing or the movement in any of both courses, every time it's something I'm concerned at that. They have a balance within, within the amount of speaking, not because of the sake of speaking, as I think we discussed this in a prior program, but with the idea that uh, uh, diminishing teachers' talking time raises the students' talking time, uh, but the idea is to have it with a purpose that the students are actually the ones in the, the ones practicing, doing, the ones actually constructing their own learning. So in that sense, in talking time, I always ask them, even in presentations, if they have pres something to that they intend to present and they wanna do it as a presentation, I'm gonna be here like a lecturer at this moment and they decide to do that, even though they do that, I ask them to balance the talking do uh, uh, it, it changes the idea of the lecture right because at the end whatever you're going to explain you have to go through different strategies to make the students tell you what you are supposed to say or analyze and understand what you want to explain instead of just explaining okay because again i just uh, i think that and and again i don't know if, if this is appropriate for this particular class but i think wow. talking more generally to in-service teachers teachers who are in the, okay. the field, looking at this and evaluating and thinking about what our students are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that, you know, if I'm getting it being observed, the tendency is going to feel like, okay, it's all about me, but really it's all about the students and it's all okay. about what the students are, are doing. And I think this idea of re reproductive versus productive, along with these other aspects of the, ep these types of episodes, I think it's really important because, again, we go back to this idea of our students generating knowledge, generating, creating right, you know, right. uh, knowledge. As we have this discussion here, nothing was planned out. We're using right. words and sentences that we've never used before in our life because we're creating the language. So are our students doing the same thing in their classroom? Because that's what they're going to 
be expected mm-hmm. to do in real life. And and I am not against memorization, rote learning, which is more of the reproductive aspect. Yes. But of course, we need to have our students have plenty of opportunities for this productive side. And we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing, right, to generate or facilitate or to create the environment where this is likely to happen? And in any teaching program, right, or any type of learning, we need to have them, the students exposed to that experience, or at least have that conversation uh, as soon as possible, because otherwise it gets too centered on the on the teacher, and it may not even be intentional, right? But if we're right. used to just constantly working, worrying about, oh, I'm, you know, am I going to speak correctly? Am I going to make yeah. a mistake? Or am I going to write a word and uh, misspell a word on the board? Or, you know, all these, you're always focusing on these problems when we should be thinking constantly of, right. of the of the learner, you know. And and I equate this a lot to whenever uh, I give a public speaking class, or if I'm in. A thesis seminar where we're helping students present their research mm-hmm. publicly in front of uh, examiners and other other people that when you're giving a presentation, it's easy to think, oh gosh, I'm nervous or you know they're gonna laugh at me with what I'm wearing or whatever. It's not about you. It's about the message. right. And so for in our classroom, it's not about us, the teacher. It's not about how popular or unpopular or who we are. It's what, the students are doing in the classroom. And I try to, for myself, ask that question every single day that I go into the classroom. I'm asking myself, what am I going to have my students do today? What are they going to do? And what can I, what do I have to do to make that happen? And that's a personal thing that I do, but it really, uh, it really is related to, uh, to this reproductive versus productive aspect of these instructional learning episodes that we really want to try to focus on our on our learners. Yes, uh, something that um, it's part of the objectives in this in this uh, segment of the listening part for students is precisely that they just uh, I know it's focused on the listening itself and the students uh, developing the ability to handle an audio in a proper way to actually help the students uh, re, uh, like uh, practice, like uh, rehearse certain aspects uh, when listening to the audio. And that's why one of the objectives uh, personally that I take with them is that uh, they, they um, adopt this idea of not not just uh, listening for the sake of listening. Avoid these ideas of, uh, are they gonna, as you mentioned before, they're gonna answer true or false and I just select what to ask because of no reason. Uh, Or I'm gonna bring a song and then I erase some words and they're gonna listen. And the closest they get to to something a little bit more uh, professional, let's say, is that uh, they select verbs and they erase the verbs and that's it. Uh, uh, one of the focuses that I have is to make them reflect in the reason or and the connection that the key aspects that the students are going to listen in the case of listening, uh, the, the reason why they decide those are the key aspects they have to listen to is specifically. And that's what makes them think about a wider aspect. Some of them go through the idea of I want to actually, uh, I want them to practice actually some things about sounds or pronunciation of words, but actually focus on the listening part or discrimination of specific sounds when the link of words are together. Some others go for the idea, oh, I want to actually go through grammar teaching with listening because of this aspect of the grammatical issue that has to do with uh, understanding uh, uh, when when listening to it or when pronouncing. Some of them plan their listening activities based on a further idea of that the students are going to produce sooner or later and they have to pronounce the words, even though the class is merely focused only on the listening aspect. Others decide, no, I'm going to focus on the context itself and what it's going to bring together, the key aspects that the students have to identify is the content itself of the class. 
because I'm going to focus on a content uh, on a content class. So uh, it doesn't have to be a uh, structural base, whatever they have to identify listening or whatever, but it has to be related to the topic and, and, and so on. Uh, but the idea is that it precisely they avoid, they avoid these situations in which there is no there's no logical reason for the listening just for the sake of saying, oh, I'm going to have a listening and I'm going to play something and they have to fill in the blanks with these words and they just erase at random, which I've read before that it's also a strategy, right? You select certain pieces of scripts and up to certain number, you count words and certain numbers of words and, and it works for a reason. But I go for the idea of whatever you do in the classroom first. Whatever you plan to do, go ahead, try it. But under the condition that you have a reason for it, whether valid or not, but give me a reason. Don't you, just, and the reason cannot be just because I decided to, to do it and that's it. No, I, there's a reason why you decided to do it or select it. And, um, and pretty much that's what it's going on when we come to the decision of, shall I break it down for students? Shall I give them more help before actually going through the uh, core activity of this class, whether listening or not, or whatever, whatever the, the aspect is to be seen? Or shall I bring the task itself as a task base and go ahead? And then when they need me, I help. And, uh, and, and, and yes, what is happening is that sometimes you try one thing, sometimes you try another, and, uh, and you start to pay attention to what happens in the classroom. Maybe the ideal thing would be, I don't know if I'm right on this, but the ideal thing for this is to be prepared for both things and then make the decision once you're there, right? Break it down or not and, and, then, and then see what happens. Something I tell my students is that uh, imagine they cannot answer. Whatever you bring to the classroom and whatever your decision is to break it down or not, just imagine that at the moment of answering something you ask, or a worship, you, a worship you bring, or just a simple question if you want to, or the whole exam or whatever it is that you're gonna, in, in which they are gonna participate and they're gonna give you information in which they're gonna produce, or maybe they're gonna reproduce, whatever. Just imagine they cannot do it. What are you gonna do about it then? I think this is a good time to, to, to distinguish clearly though the, the difference between performance tests, which we've talked a lot about in the past, and task-based learning. These are not the same thing. They're different things. And your question about, well, do we work on individual you know, uh, activities or, or focus on specific language aspects or do we focus on the task itself is going to depend on where we are in the series of, uh, of activities. Are we working still towards the performance task, again, which is going to be our end goal? Mm -hmm. We talked about setting up performance tasks, let's say, every two weeks, every month. Yeah. But the idea is that we set up and des design a performance task that uh, learners can use all four skills, practice their grammar, their pronunciation, their vocabulary, all aspects of language in this quote unquote authentic or as authentic as possible type of scenario. But then all of the prior classes or lessons that lead up to that performance task, we could look at it as a task based learning or at least activities that enable students to go to the next level to continue continually to increase their knowledge and skills as they progress over time and and as it leads up to that performance task in your particular case for that class having a 15 minute class actually i, I wanted to ask bd what how frequently do they give that 15 minute class what do you mean by how frequently? Like oh, how they give it once a week or every six weeks. They have a fifteen-minute class. Every six weeks. Yeah, each of them. The thing is that we have an input session in which they they go through a summary of what they've seen in theory about the aspect they have to put in practice, and after that input session, uh, we we go we we start the sessions in which they teach for fifteen minutes each of them. And because of the amount of students, it lasts five sessions. So every it's, it's every six classes. Sorry, every six classes, they uh, they go back and teach again. And how many classes do they have a week? That's uh, like every two weeks, they teach and and they would wait for two weeks to teach again. 
Oh, every two weeks. So every two yeah, weeks. Every two weeks. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So is there a way to, um, or maybe you already do this, but have each student who presents his or her own 15 minute segment build on each other? Like they. Some of them, some of them do it by themselves. Uh, but it, but it's not for all of the classes during the semester, just for two or three of them. It has happened before. I've, uh, I've never made the decision of encouraging them to do it. I, I sometimes suggest things, but I don't, I don't go through it uh, uh, like a strong. I don't come strong on that because uh, it depends on how the performance goes. Right. And let me be clear about this. Some of them are at a, at a level in which they need to downgrade many aspects of the class in order to be able to develop certain skills that they have to develop at that moment. Right. For example, things like control anxiety in front of a group, things as simple as those. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I always go for the idea that we cannot go for a bigger bite with, with some students in, in that sense because we are going to sacrifice what they have what what they are intended to develop at that moment but that doesn't take i think this goes to the answer of the question uh, but that doesn't uh, i have the opportunity for students who are far away more more advanced or more used to teaching that would be the proper way to say it therefore um, they are more used to teaching and they already have more experience in making decisions i think that's the w best way to do it and those students, uh, I have the opportunity to challenge them a little bit more. And not because I, I command them to do something, is because I strongly suggest certain things which by themselves in the feedback session they have said it. Well, I really wanted to bring something challenging this time as you suggested last time, so I did this. And they specifically mentioned what was the challenge for them. And uh, and that uh, that's uh, that's why I don't focus that much into make a connection or or have a wider view or plan a whole thing as a performance test, let's say, in which you are going to fit certain aspects of this because maybe it's not the moment in which they are in that in that part because it's the first time they teach. They have there are certain things they have to develop. I go for the basics, uh, technical basic things beyond the the um, the theoretical and meta linguistic aspects things like uh actually plan <laughs> actually have an objective which you don't miss things like keep students working actually working not just think that they are working because there's there are 15 participations in in uh, 30 students group and you think everybody i mean that was a good uh, practice because you had 15 opinions whether at the end in truth it was just one opinion from each student from 15 and and the whole time was spent and things like this are the ones that, that are focused now in the program itself uh, there are certain aspects in this semester it's focused on teaching listening teaching writing reading pronunciation and certain uh, uh, theoretical aspects they have to be aware of when teaching these skills and i think that's that's the the minimum level required that they're actually aware of why they decide to take to take certain action in that specific skill teaching in this case listening and that's why i come to face this question again do you break it down before or not i mean i'm not facing them with this question they are also they some of them are having the question by themselves. What do I do first? Do I help them or do I ask them to do it? And uh, and the uh, what we have come up with because it's not an answer. It's just an idea that at the end, after reflecting, tutor and student and analyzing what the idea of the of the fifteen minutes is, uh, it's like make the decision. And some of them decide. Well, I'm going to change it. I'm going to have a something more in the pre-listening to something a little bit uh, more uh, broken for them. Uh, to be prepared and some others say no I'm going for the whole bite and then if needed I'm gonna downgrade and, and and I think that's pretty much the focus this time 
And I think really getting back to that question too, how I would look at it is, is looking at these different instructional learning episodes. I, I, for me, this, I think, helps me connect the dots to this, yeah. this episode is knowing why, knowing why we, uh, something is either working or not, not mm -hmm. working. And being able to say, okay, are my students producing or reproducing? Are my, am I spending enough time on metacognitive aspects of learning versus cognitive? Uh, when this 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 addresses like learning strategies, for example, um, am I providing new context, or are they always working in the same context? Mm -hmm. And just trying to articulate those uh, over time to see, okay, if you know, and trying different things. I think part of the thing, you know, especially. Well, in any case, I'm a big proponent of trying new things and not mm -hmm. being afraid of, you know, right. taking risks, even if you you fail, because it's always a learning experience. As long as we're reflecting on those and asking ourselves, what are my students doing, and am I achieving those goals? Mm -hmm. But I think that I think it's just a matter of trying new things and uh, and sharing, really, you know, sharing uh, even. Uh, the challenges that you face with others. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we decided to have a weekly podcast, Teacher Learning Cast, so that uh, others can share and participate and have a voice and try to learn from, from each other. I think that w whatever community you gravitate towards, if it's TLC or some other uh, community, I think the main thing that we want to encourage everyone is to start sharing more with others and whether within your own school system or outside of your school, but try to reach out and uh, not be afraid of sharing your experiences because again, I think that's the best way uh, to learn and, uh, and network with other teachers. Yeah, if I recall well, when I was teaching international baccalaureate, uh, it was a requirement for you to look for another teacher and show them what you had planned. It was, it was in the manual, in fact, because they had manuals for, for this. Uh, uh, and, and I remember one of the aspects, I don't remember if it was focused on evaluation, because they had a kind of a different way of evaluating too. I mean, it was not a traditional way of evaluation, or uh, something related to, to uh, project plans. But one of the requirements it was that uh, once you finish with all of this, you have to go to another language teacher and show it and tell him and ask for feedback. <laughs> and I see nothing wrong with that. I think that's a, that's yeah. certainly a, a valid uh, choice. I also would encourage though, those who maybe are afraid of um, how sharing their experiences might influence their, uh, their teacher evaluation, I think there are plenty of opportunities using technology, of course, where you can be involved and actually share and have it not influence right. your teacher evaluation. So um, I think you just have to be strategic and knowing how to do that and finding the right communities. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's a really important aspect is really recognizing the influence one's uh, teacher evaluation has on on one's professional development. Right. But that's another topic for another day, Petey. Yeah, Ben, we have come to uh, pass the hour and we still have two more questions to go, so let's leave them for another time. Uh, I think uh, it was very interesting to share these ideas and to clarify uh, that I, I go for the idea that there's no right answer in certain questions. I don't know if this is one of them, I still don't know. I think we're gonna keep on working on the series. Uh, I, I, I see it as a series because it, this all goes through the idea, as you mentioned at the beginning, equity in the classroom, right? And and sooner or later, we're gonna get to, to a connection about that. And I think we're gonna follow up whatever we discussed today. Absolutely. We wanna thank everybody for listening and uh, feel free to let us know how your experiences in the classroom, how if you've had this experience where you've either felt like you've hindered the educative experience or you've facilitated what you've done, what corrections you've made. Share us your experiences. If there's any topics that you want us to discuss in the future, feel free to uh, make those suggestions in our Facebook. I think that's the easiest way, uh, Teacher Learning Cast. And uh, again, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't hesitate to give us some feedback, positive or negative, it's all good. Uh, we, we just like to share our opinions. Our opinions are our own. and um, 
we want to hear from you. BD, yeah. thanks a lot for this uh, broadcast. I don't think I don't know if you have some closing. Yeah, closing yeah. Man. I think uh, you never know. Uh, you never know which is the aspect, the the word, the phrase, the comment, or the argument that is going to make click on on your mind when needed. In which moment, you you never know which is the aspect that is going to give you that learning, and when is the time that it's going to click in your brain in order to create a change in something for a benefit. So uh, the idea is to put it out, share it, and, and, and let us know. I want to thank uh, everybody that follow us today in the Facebook Live transmission, Noemi, uh, Carla, Alma Zaragoza, Bert Rodriguez, Norma Rocha, Elizabeth, my sis, and uh, Jero Duarte, also Osvaldo, Ricardo, Angie Garay, uh, Jonas, uh, that join us today for a while in the live transmission. Thank you very much. Yeah, we've got to get we've got to figure out a way to to bring in some of those Facebook guys and and gals right. into Vero, into our live broadcast. Vero, we are finishing Vero Duron. We are finishing the cast today, but uh, we'll wait for you next week. We would like you to join us to talk about something uh, for next time. And feel free, the guys who follow us on on Facebook, uh, you don't have to join the whole broadcast. If you just want right. to come in, say a few words. Uh, just contribute to the conversation, and then if you have to leave, it's all good. This is a very informal discussion. We want to keep it that way. And, uh, again, uh, we would love to have people just come in and out. I try to include the link each week in Facebook, so I always include two links. I, I include the YouTube broadcast, and I also include the live uh, broadcast in Google Hangouts, which would enable you to enter just like we're here in the in the Hangout, and you will then be part of the uh, recording. So uh, this is open, of course, and all of the uh, uh, broadcasts are recorded. Uh, keep that in mind, but uh, we do want to encourage all of you to to come in. So feel free to do that, Petey. I think we'll stop there for today. Nice. I want to thank you uh, for your for your comments nice. and insights for this week, and we thank everybody for. Uh, listening in uh, this week, and we will see everyone next week, next Saturday. Keep on learning.